if any, who shall attend and represent the assembly in the proceeding before the Senate. Two, indicating the mode of appearance before the Senate, whether in person, by advocate, or in person, by advocate, and by advocate. Three, indicating the names and addresses of the persons to be called as witnesses, if any, and witness statements containing a summary of the evidence to be presented by such witnesses before the Senate. And four, specifying any other evidence to be relied on. Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, on Saturday the 17th of August 2024, the Office of the Clerk of the Senate received a response reference number HKM dash CAM stroke IM dash 2024 stroke CGA stroke 2024 034 and dated the 17th of August 2024 to the invitation to appear issued to the Governor from Mrs. Mutuma Gishuru and Associates Advocates, who indicated that the governor had appointed the firm to represent her in the proceedings before the Senate, and that the governor would also appear in person and by advocates. The letter also indicated the list of counsel representing the governor and the list of witnesses for the governor. Similarly, on the 17th of August, 2024, the office of the clerk of the Senate received a response, reference number one stroke CAM stroke 001 stroke AB stroke 24 and dated the 17th of August 2024 to the invitation to appear issued to the county assembly from Messrs. A and B advocates, LLP, indicating the firm had been appointed to represent the county assembly. The letter also indicated the advocates representing the county assembly and the witnesses for the county assembly. Pursuant to Rule 8 of the Rules of Procedure, when considering the proposal, proposed removal from office of a governor in plenary, on Saturday the 17th of August 2024, the clerk of the Senate furnished each party with a documentation filed by the other party in accordance with Rule 6 and 7 of the Rules of Procedure. Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, the hearing program which has been appended in today's order paper, detail the various activities in the hearing and determination of the matter and the time allocated to each activity. It will be crucial, therefore, that all the parties comply with the time allocated. The parties will be notified of the balance of time on each activity through the clerks at the table. In summary, the program states that today, Monday, the 19th of August, 2024, after we have dispensed with the preliminary matters, the charges against the governor, as submitted by the county assembly, shall be read. The governor will be given an opportunity to take a plea on the charges. This will be followed by an opening statement by the county assembly and thereafter by the governor. After the conclusion of the opening statements, the presentation of the case of the county assembly shall commence. After the presentation of the case by the county assembly, Honorable Senators will be given an opportunity to ask questions or seek clarification for the County Assembly. This should take us up to the end of today's sitting. At the sitting schedule for tomorrow, Tuesday the 20th of August 2024, the Governor will have an opportunity to present her case before the Senate. Honorable Senators will also, have, will also be given an opportunity to ask questions or seek clarification from the Governor following which the closing statements by the parties will be made for a period not exceeding one hour each. The Senate shall then proceed to debate prior to voting on each of the charges. At this stage, a supplementary order paper will be issued to facilitate this debate. In accordance with Section 33.7 of the County Governments Act 2012 and standing on the 86 of the Senate Standing Orders, the voting shall be by county delegations. The governor shall see to hold office if a majority of all county delegations of the Senate vote to uphold any impeachment charge. If, however, the vote in the Senate fails to result in the removal of the county uh, governor pursuant to standing order 87, the Speaker of the Senate shall notify the Speaker of the Meru County Assembly accordingly. Now, Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, I now invite counsel for the Meru County Assembly to introduce the legal team of the County Assembly and the members of the Meru County Assembly 
representing the county assembly by stating the full name and the mention of each person. You may proceed, counsel for the county assembly. Thank you very kindly, honorable speaker. My name is Ndegwanjiru. I'll be appearing together for the County Assembly of Meru County together with Mr. Mwangi Ndegwa, Mr. Muregi Eric Murioki Advocate, Mr. Mweruru Bonface Mawera Advocate, and Mr. Mwenda Anthony Advocate. On the part of the appearance, Mr. Speaker Sir, for the County Assembly members, we have ourselves Mr. Ngure Benson, Kenya. We have Mr. Baptista Muriuki, uh, Muriki Kanyura, Kanyaru. We have Linda and Kirote Kirinji. We appear together with them, but for the purposes of um, the county assembly appearances, we have Honorable Zipora Kinya, MCA, Honorable Auleria Murangiri. Kirimana, MCA, Hyrin uh, Kawera, Kamencho, uh, MCA. Those are the appearances, Mr. Speaker, sir. I am most humbled. Thank you. All the honorable senators, uh, Senator Faki, take your seat, please. And I invite the council for the governor to introduce the legal team representing the governor and, the, and uh, the governor by stating the full name and destination of each person. You may proceed, Council. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Sir, the governor's team is as follows. Number one, the governor herself, Her Excellency Honorable Kawira Mangaza, is present. In terms of legal counsel, the team is as follows. My name is Elisha Ongoya, legal counsel. I'm assisted by Mr. Elias Mutuma, legal counsel, Ms. Brida Kimathi, legal counsel, Mr. Robert Mutembei, legal counsel, Mr. Edgar Busiega, legal counsel, and Mr. Collins Mwenda, legal counsel. We are also assisted by a team of legal assistants, namely Mr. Brian Lee Maingi, Michelle Makandi, Sylvia Njoki, Victor Koome, and Ms. Noble Wandera. And we shall also be joined by witnesses in this matter, led by the governor herself, Her Excellency Honorable Kawira Mwangaza, Mr. Ibrahim Mutwiri Kirimi, Mr. Dixon Munene Nkanata, Honorable Evans Mawira Kaaria, member of the county assembly, Honorable Frida Naito Gitobu, member of the County Assembly, and Honorable Jacob Murigi Muturi, member of the County Assembly. That is the Governor's team, and thank you so much. Thank you. Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Senate, I welcome the County Assembly team, the Governor's team, members of the public and the media to the Senate and to these proceedings. Finally, I will now invite the clerk to read the charges against Honorable Kawira Mungaza, the governor of Meru County. Clerk, you may proceed. Order number four, reading of the charges on the proposed removal from office by impeachment of Honorable Kawira Mungaza, the governor of Meru County. The Honorable Kawera Mangaza, Governor of Meru County, please take the stand. Honorable Kawera Mangaza, the Governor of Meru County, the charges against you as received from the County Assembly of Meru are as follows. Charge number one. Gross violation of the Constitution and other laws. 
that the governor has grossly violated, among others, articles 10 to 27, 41, 47, 73, 232, 235, 236, and 251 of the Constitution, to sections 10, 15, 19, and 24 of the Public Officer Ethics Act 2003, 3, sections 3, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 1, B, F, 21, 29, and 59 of the Leadership and Integrity Act 2012, 4, sections 2, 33, 45, 55, 58, 59, 59, A, 63, 64, 65, and 69 of the County Governments Act 2012, 5, section 4 of the Public Appointments County Assemblies Approval Act, 6, section 4 of the Fair Administrative Action Act, 7, section 6 of the Meru County Investment and Development Corporation Act, 8, section 97B of the Meru County Revenue Board Act, 9, section 10, 6 of the Meru County Investment and Development Corporation Act, and 10, section 19 of the Meru County Water and Sanitation Services Act, by engagement, connivance, and or complicity in the following. One, illegally revoking the appointment of CPA Virginia Kawera Meriti as secretary stroke CEO of the Meru County Public Service Board without a vote of not less than 75% of all the members of the county assembly and in usurpation of the powers of the county assembly contrary to sections 58, 4, and 5 and 59 of the County Governments Act. Two, failing to appoint the chairpersons of the Meru County Revenue Board, Meru Microfinance Corporation, Meru Youth Service Board, and Meru County Investment and Development Corporation Board as required by law, thus failing to operationalize the said boards and or illegally appointing the said chairpersons without vetting and approval by the County Assembly, contrary to Section 4 of the Public Appointments County Assembly's Approval Act. The respective secretariats of the said boards continue to draw and expend public funds without duly appointed board members to exercise a supervisory role over the board's secretariats in order to ensure accountability in the spending of funds, thus jeopardizing service delivery. Three, refusing to implement the recommendations and or resolutions of the county assembly requiring the governor to A, dismiss the county secretary, Dr. Kiambi Aderu Dambura, and the chief of staff, Mr. Harrison Gatobu Nchamba Mbivi, from office for gross violation of the constitution and other laws, and B, blatantly ignoring or failing to submit a report to the county assembly on the implementation of the said recommendations within 60 days as required in the report of the county assembly dated 23rd December 2023, contrary to article 183.3 of the constitution. Four, illegally dismissing Dr. Ntoiti, CEO of County Revenue Board, Paul Mwaki, CEO of Lika Board, Kenneth Kimathi Mbae, Managing Director of Meru Microfinance Corporation, and Joseph Kithure Mberia, CEO MEWASS, in usurpation of the powers of the appointing authorities, contrary to Section 97B of the Meru County Revenue Board Act and Section 106 of the Meru County Investment and Development Corporation Act, as a result of which the county government of Meru has been slapped with costs and damages amounting to Kenya shillings 4 million by the Employment and Labor Relations Court. Charge 2, gross misconduct, that the governor has engaged in gross misconduct by 
deliberately and knowingly misleading the public by giving false information that Kenya Shillings 86 million had been raised through the pay bill number 247247, 247, account number 0400163917. Eight nine nine, established after the murder of Daniel Muthiani, alias Sniper, while the correct position is that only Kenya shillings 286,516 was raised, thus violating the moral and ethical requirements expected of a state officer, contrary to section 19 of the Public Officer Ethics Act and section 29 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Charge three, abuse of office, that the governor has engaged in acts and omissions which singularly and collectively amount to abuse of office and gross violation of, among others, Articles 10, 73, 201, 226, 5, and 232 of the Constitution, Sections 8, 12, 13, 1, and 35 of the Leadership and Integrity Act 2012, and sections 45, 2, and 46 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act by the following. One, the irregular payment of emergency call allowances to 161 doctors and medical officers using the wrong rates, leading to excessive payment of Kenya shillings 74,340, 74 million 340,000, contrary to sections 45, 2, and 46 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, sections 11 and 15 of the Public Officer Ethics Act, and section 12, 1 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Two, use of manual payroll to pay personnel emoluments amounting to Kenya shillings 102.94 million, which is 3.1% of personnel emolument costs, contrary to section 6.7.6 of the County Financial Accounting and Reporting Manual. Three, employing a bloated workforce of at least 111 personal staff in the office of the governor, thus contributing to an increase in the wage bill by more than Kenya shillings 500 million and an excessive wage bill that is 49% of the annual revenue allocation far beyond the 35% limit set by Section 25, 1A and B of the Public Finance Management County Government Regulations 2015. And four, paying Kiambi Christas Manyara, a public communication officer in the office of the governor, his full salary and benefits while in remand and despite being accused of murder, contrary to Section 4.2, of the Public Service Commission Discipline Manual for the Public Service. The Honorable Kawera Mwangaza, how do you plead to the three charges? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Now, Honorable Senators, pursuant to Rule 17 of the Rules of Procedure, as contained in the third schedule to the Senate Standing Orders, each party will have 30 minutes to make their opening statements. Not more than 30 minutes. We will start with the county assembly. The floor is yours. Honorable Speaker, the members of the assembly, I seek your guidance um, before we make our address. And I seek leave on rule 10 of the standing rules in Article 50 of the Constitution in respect to a preliminary issue that has risen and equally Rule 14. Any preliminary questions or issues raised by the County Assembly or the Governor shall be urged for not more than 30 minutes unless the Speaker otherwise directs. Honorable Speaker, I seek your guidance in respect to a communication that was done to this house by the county assembly via a letter dated 17th August 2024 and another dated 18th August 2024. 
in the letter dated 18th August 2024, Mr. Speaker, sir, we thought that, um, the, sorry, let me begin on dated. Um, the 17th. We sought the indulgence of this honorable speaker to exercise its powers to summon a witness who was not within our ability. That is one CPA Virginia Kawera Meriti, who is currently the CEO of the Meru County Public Service Board. In our letter, Honorable Speaker, we laid out the basis upon which our application is premised and that the was a thought that she comes with any relevant information that relates to the proceedings before this assembly this morning. Virginia currently works with the county government of Meru and she's she the CEO whom we intend to speak to various issues raised in our motion. That is to me, um, Honorable Speaker, that she's an integral infrastructure in respect to laying the case and the basis of our, um, the motion for impeachment to the extent that if her availability is not secured, we end up um, prejudicing the case for the county assembly. Equally, Mr. Speaker, sir, so it's pen off and secret guidance we were served with the documents and the responses from the governor's response team and as correctly put and captured by your address this morning, Mr. Speaker, sir, we noted that there were some issues and very serious issues that were raised. Some of them bordering between criminality or forgery of documents. Mr. Speaker, sir, in that respect, we noticed from the governor's response a letter from one Linda Gaki Kiyome who is the legal advisor to the governor as at 23rd February 2024. We equally noted a letter, a purported letter from Jacob Kirari, the, count, the clerk of the county assembly. This letter is purportedly received by the Speaker of the County Assembly of Meru. Mr. Speaker, sir, those two letters have been addressed and annexed as KM5, appearing on page, one, uh, page 11 to 12 of the Governor's response at volume 1B. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, sir, the County Assembly of Meru seeks the, to summon the one Linda to come and speak to the authenticity of that letter. When we contacted, when she saw the response, she filed an affidavit which is yet to be placed on record before this Honorable Senate but filed with the office of the clerk to the assembly dated 18th of August, 2024. Mr. Speaker, sir, the risk of us not summoning these two individuals, and especially Mr. Jacob to come and tell us whether the county assembly ever received those re uh, letters from the, co uh, the, the county governor, will be that they, we shall proceed on the basis of evidence that has criminal liability that has criminal aspects will proceed to answer and to hear a case and a defense that is tainted with illegality. That means, Your, Your Honor, so that means, Mr. Speaker, sir, that Article 50 of the Constitution shall be infringed, a right to a fair hearing which must and shall not be derogated. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is alleged by the response at paragraph 54 to 56 of the Council governor's Council response. for the uh, county assembly. Yes, sir. Are you still on the request? Yes, sir. I, I paid off of that. You're still I, on the preliminary issue. I seek your guidance. I paid off that. We seek the summoning of 
Virginia. So let's dispense with that first. Yes. Then you may proceed to, to make your opening statement. Yeah, in the alternative, if these are not going to be summoned, we seek to expunge from record the affidavit of one The affidavit of one Nkanata Dixon Monene, and most importantly, the offending paragraph three, and the governor's response that has cited those particular letters that are that we claim to be an illegality and a forgery. But would appreciate if it was someone, a most humble. Counsel for the Governor, what say you in response to that request? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, distinguished Senators, there appear to be multiple requests wrapped up as one. So I'll respond to it as follows. There is a formal request before this House for the summons to Virginia Kawira as a witness. We have no objection to the summons to Virginia Kawira as a witness. There is a statement made by my counsel that he has to produce relevant documents. Now, one of the things that these rules of procedure frown upon is trial by ambush. And therefore we concede to a summons to Virginia Kawira to attend this Senate and make such comments as are necessary on the documents already filed and shared between the parties. On the request in respect of the summons for Linda Kome, we have not been served by any such request. We are hearing it for the first time here, and we also don't know the justification for that because there's no document letter or request served upon us. On the request to expunge the affidavit or part of the affidavit of Dixon Monene Nkanata and certain paragraphs from the response, our reply is simple. Evidence, the credibility or otherwise of evidence is tested in cross-examination. We shall present each of these witnesses here as witnesses, Mr. Speaker, and the assembly side will have an opportunity to test whatever theories and hypotheses that they have about their candor of their testimony by instrument of cross-examination. We humbly submit. Thank you, counsel, for the governor. Now, the counsel for the county assembly has made two requests. One, to the effect that uh, summons are issued to three additional witnesses to come and support the case of the county assembly. And two, certain paragraphs of two affidavits be expunged. Now, this is the ruling of the Senate. The request to issue summons to three witnesses to come and support the case of the county assembly is hereby granted. The request to expunge certain paragraphs of two affidavits is deemed premature at this juncture and therefore it is denied. Council for the county assembly, you may now proceed to take your not more than 30 minutes to make your opening statements. would be the directions and the ruling of the Senate. Honorable members, I shall take the first 15 minutes and equally share the same with my learned friend. Honorable Senators, you are being called this morning for the third uh, Council for the County Assembly. Uh, if I heard uh, the Council for the Governor correctly, the letter indicating that you had intended to summon to call uh, Linda Gaki Kyome and Mr. Jacob Kirari, that letter was not made available to the governor's team. 
you know, if we may we allow, we have called council. Let it be made available immediately. We are most obliged. Let it be made available immediately. We are most obliged. You may proceed. And your time starts running from now. Honorable members, you are being called for the third time to interrogate the character and the ability of Governor Kawira to govern the county of Meru, the county government of Meru. It's not usual that an individual can be called and be brought before this assembly without a reason. There is a fundamental reason that underline, underlies her ability to govern. You're being called for the third time to interrogate the ability of Governor Kawera to manage the resources of the county of Meru. You're being called upon for the third time to interrogate the ability of Governor Kawera to ensure that there is effective service delivery of services to the people and the residents of Meru County. Accountability, honorable members, is a measure of leadership. Accountability is the ability of an individual to be held to account for our actions. It's not a call for interrogating the weakness of an individual, but the ability of that individual to execute her constitutional mandate. For the third time, there cannot be malice. This cannot be personal vendetta. There is no relationship that is unconstitutional between the governor and the, the county assembly that can make the county assembly to be aggrieved on behalf of the people of Meru County for the third time. Accountability is the gateway to earning trust. We are here because there is serious trust deficit with the ability of Governor Kawira to govern the county of Meru. We shall bring evidence before you, Honorable Senators, how reckless statements that flies over the face of, Art of uh, Chapter 6 of the Constitution in respect of the ability of an elected leader at the status of a governor to be able to earn confidence in the office that she holds. We'll show you how families are broken down, courtesy of reckless statements that are not accountable, made and attributed to the governor. Honorable Senators, we shall bring before you evidence how money and resources that Kenyans are on a day-to-day basis working hard to generate are being misused at the heart and the behest of the governor at the quest or behest of her inability to govern the resources, her inability to manage the county government of Meru, her inability to be in charge of the county. That is the case that we have before you. And when she's called to answer to the same, she has always an escape route. She has manufactured a serious safety valve that makes sure that she's never held to account of her actions. She blames others. She keeps on saying it wasn't me. She's in charge of the county that, as we speak, has embezzled courtesy of maintaining a manual payroll. Kenya shillings, 212 million hard earned money due to the inability to manage the county. We have a governor who is serving in the county government of Meru and who is not able to manage her human resource. When proper procedures are taken, when pro proper procedures are called out by the employees, they are victimized. They are victimized because she wants to maintain a system that is not accountable. This house has recent the occasions. And whenever I appear before this house, I live with confidence, whether we win the case or we lose the case, that this house has done its work. This is the house that will go to the history of this republic that it has been out to hold individuals accountable, irrespective of your agenda, irrespective of your association, irrespective of your political association. This house has remained true to its calling. This house has remained very impartial to the processes. And that is why for the third time we are bringing a case against Governor Wakawira, because we have confidence in this house that we look to the facts of the case and dispense with substantive justice.
The first step towards success is taking responsibility of your actions. The first measure, the measures, or we, uh, the measures of one's personal character is attributed to the ability to manage the responsibilities that has been bestowed and granted unto you. And if you cannot then be held accountable, if you will always be blaming others, then what is your role? When those others are making that mistake, when those others are embezzling the funds, where are you? What actions have you taken? We'll bring cases where the county assembly has attempted to hold um, accountable the governor, Reports made before the county, uh, the county assembly, someone's issued, recommendation made, and the governor declines. With contempt, ridicule, and spite on the part of the county assembly. That is the case that we have. Honorable senators, holding people accountable is a show of love. When you hold somebody accountable, you are simply saying, Honorable Senators, that you are capable of a bigger or to do bigger things. This is not out of malice. It's not out of any personal vendetta. It's to show the love that the county assembly has for the people of Meru. We'll present before you evidence that public participation was effectively carried out. 85% of the participants giving a verdict that supports the county assembly's case will give you evidence that 48, 40, 49 county assembly members voted in support of the motion. These are not relatives to the, the governor. They have no any fraternic association with the governor. They are people who are simply executing their mandate as bestowed by the constitution. That is the simplicity of the case that we have. We'll give you, we'll bring you evidence of a witness who is currently displaced from her matrimonial home, courtesy of the responsibility of the governor. Courtesy of the governor, inability to manage how she relates the members of the public. We'll bring you the sniper's wife. The sniper's wife is a, is a, is a case before this assembly. Not to prosecute the murder case, but to prosecute chapter 6 of the constitution in respect to the governor ability to manage the county. As I pen off and invite my learned friend, the Honorable Senators, we invite objectivity in the case. You brought evidence by Governor Kawera, former individuals who moved this motions before for her impeachment have now been staged as a witness. You realize what happened what don't occur to this county member of assembly who just the other day a few months ago was moving the impeachment for the governor and now they have become a darling of the governor is that really a conduct that is consistent with innocence that is consistent with integrity and accountability and transparency we'll bring you that evidence we'll show you why this uh, a serious turn of events honorable senators kindly allow me to invite mr mawira for further submissions i am most humbled Honorable Speaker, uh, my name is Moreno Bonfis Mavera. And the question is, is it for the joy of doing it? Is it merely for the joy of it that the Assembly of Meru is before you for the time? Is it merely of it? Honorable Senators, clearly and logically, is it merely for the joy of it? Honorable Senators, clearly and logically, there is a problem. And the County Assembly of Meru has diagnosed that problem. The County Assembly of Meru is beseeching you to find a remedy, to find a cure to this problem. Meru is ailing, and this house has a proper medication to this problem. 
We are going to demonstrate, Honorable Speaker, through various testimonies and exhibits that we have already filed, that there is a serious breakdown of governance in Meru. How is the Meru County Assembly expected to function if its oversight function has been crippled by the executive? How is the Meru County Assembly expected to exercise its oversight role if summons, statements, and, the, and resolutions of the County Assembly, even recommendations, are ignored and disregarded by the County Executive under the watchful eye, cover, and protection of the Governor? The County Assembly summons witnesses to appear before it, or members of the Executive, they, can, they do not heed such summons. What redress is the county assembly left with other than coming before you? This, this house is a protector of devolution, and we beseech you to protect devolution that is on its deathbed in Meru. We will demonstrate, honorable senators, countless discreditable acts, all of which amount to gross violation of the constitution and other laws, abuse of office, and gross misconduct. Of course, there is, and I, I'm not belittling what my learned senior said, that money has been lost, but there's a lot of misinformation out there that for you to prove or to succeed in an impeachment process or for an impeachment charge to be upheld, you need to show that money has been lost or there is misappropriation. And I'll refer you to Article 1, it's one of the Constitution, and its replica in Section 33 of the County Government Act. The, the, the Constitution talks about gross violation of the Constitution, gross misconduct, or abuse of office. That provision, Honorable Speaker, is to, be, is to be read holistically, is to be read together with Article 75 of the Constitution, which talks about conduct of state officers. And I'll read it, I'll read that provision, Honorable Speaker, that are State officer shall behave whether in public official life or in private life in a manner that does, that does not demean the office that state officer holds. That is a provision. So it is not just a matter of misappropriation or loss of, loss of money. Your conduct as a state officer, whether in public official life or private life, would equally meet the threshold for impeachment. And I will not state names, but we have seen in this very republic gross misconduct by state officers elsewhere. And they have, held, they have been held to account, notwithstanding that there was no loss of money. Honorable Speaker, we will show you specific acts by the governor in our own name. And therefore the defense of it wasn't me does not avail itself. Of course attempts have been made by the governor to deflect these specific acts on a part, including through forgery of documents. And those documents have been filed. And they are before you, honorable senators. And those documents, which the county assembly contains, are outright forgeries, are meant to, to, are meant to drink this honorable house and to deflect the attention of this house from the real issues. And the real issues, for example, that forgery relates to a specific act by the governor in revoking the appointment of the CEO of the Middle County Public Service Board. But letters have been forged to cover up and to drink this honorable house, to divert attention from that specific act in our own name, by our own signature, and under our own hand. We are going to demonstrate, Honorable Speaker, that the Governor has continued, has persisted in a path of impunity through the County Secretary and the Chief of Staff. And this has been raised in previous, in previous impeachment proceedings. The Governor said it wasn't me, but luckily, Honorable Speaker, the law envisages such a situation as the one before you, where a state officer, a public officer, says, it wasn't me, it was so and so. Section 24 of the Public Officer Act and Section 35 of the Leadership and Integrity Act 
is about the conduct of a state officer acting through others. And those provisions are expressed that that public officer is still liable for the acts that are done through others. So even if that act was done by someone else, the law envisages that acting through others is not a defense to such to certain acts by the state officer. What recourse, Honorable Speaker, does the County Assembly have if it made recommendations pursuant to previous impeachment proceedings that the Governor take action against these specific officers? The Governor disregarded those recommendations of the Assembly. The Governor ignored those resolutions. So, should the County Assembly sit pretty as this cabal of officers continues to run Meru down or to take Meru down the drain. These officers might have stopped in their tracks, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, the events leading to this day, the fact that this motion is before you is what I would call an act of grace. It is by the grace of God himself and the county assembly as an opportunity to be heard before this house today. There have been many threats, intimidation, and that an attempted arson of the county assembly on the eve of the debate of the impeachment motion. And this is the county assembly that is expected to oversee the governor. Clearly, honorable speaker, clearly, honorable speaker, all attempts have been made to hamstring the county assembly in the exercise of its oversight mandate and even to hamstring this house in the exercise of its oversight mandate. We were told at some point that the county assembly and even this house do not have jurisdiction and we should appear before during Cheke for hearing of the charges. The governor, of course, will tell you, Honorable Speaker, that the county assembly is abusing its oversight role. And that the county assembly has been held captive by some external forces. But my question, Honorable Speaker, is how is that an answer to any of the charges? For instance, how is that an answer to the charge or the allegation that the governor illegally revoked the appointment of the CEO of the Meru County Public Service Board and our own hand and signature and name. How is this reported capture by external forces a response to these specific allegations against the governor? Many other attempts will be made, Honorable Speaker, to deflect or to divert attention from the real issues. Videos will be played by some common man or ordinary people in Meru, even abusing this honorable house, abusing the speaker, abusing the senators, saying that this is a house of greed and bribery. But how, how is that an answer to the specific charges? And all these videos are not by members of the county assembly, they are not by elected leaders, they are just by wannabes or whatever you may call them, but probably even political activists. There is a real attempt to shift your attention from the issues that are in the motion so that you consider other extraneous material that is not in any way associated with the county assembly and to pass a verdict. Of course, one that is not just to the county assembly. Authority that is vested in a state officer, honorable speaker, is a public trust. And pursuant to Article 73, it should be exercised in a manner that promotes confidence, public confidence, in the integrity of that office. And it should bring honor and dignity to that office. It should equally demonstrate respect for the people. 
we are going to play video evidence before you of some utterances by the governor that are not only insensitive, but they do not demonstrate. They actually fall short of the constitutional requirement that a governor in his or her conduct should demonstrate respect for the people. All these allegations, Honorable Speaker, fall within Chapter 6 of the Constitution, and specifically Article 75, which provides that any person who is involved in conduct that falls short of the constitutional requirements may be dismissed or, rem or otherwise removed from office. So this is not a novelty, or this is not an invention of the county assembly. This is the Constitution. The Constitution says that such conduct is not only to be rebuked or to be condemned, but it is conduct that amounts to grounds for removal from office. Honorable Speaker, the governor will take, of course, the underlying tone of the governor's response, and that is the posture that she will take when she takes the stand, is that she is a victim, a victim of misogyny, a victim of male chauvinism, a victim of you know, toxic masculinity, and all these other gender attacks against her. And even in her own response, and even in her response, she says that she's a woman governor, and we appreciate that. It is the people of Meru who elected her, including the men in Meru County. Some of them are even here. Some others are members of the assembly. But is gender a shield? Should your gender be a cover that you cannot be held account because you're male or you're female? Is that it, Honorable Speaker? As a panel of Honorable Speaker, is it the issue of the threshold for impeachment? And the Supreme Court has had occasion in the Songko case to state with precision the threshold requirement for impeachment proceedings. And the Supreme Court has stated, Honorable Speaker, that the threshold is not the threshold required to prove criminal culpability in criminal cases. It is not the threshold of beyond reasonable doubt. It is the threshold of above a balance of probability, but, be, but below reasonable doubt. So therefore, that intermediate standard of proof, Honorable Speaker, through the various exhibits and testimonies that we are going to play before you and present before you, is a threshold that would not only be met, but the county assembly will equally discharge the burden on its part in, in line with that interpretation by the Supreme Court. Another question, Honorable Speaker, is what amounts to grossness? The Constitution talks about gross violation of the Constitution and gross misconduct. And therefore, the Supreme Court, while quoting the decision in Martin Nega Wambora from the Court of Appeal, clarified that one, the, the allegations must be serious, substantial, and weighty, and that there must be a nexus. Honorable Speaker, specific acts done by the governor other acts done through officers who are working under her and are watchful high cover and protection. All these are specific acts attributable to her. She's dis disregarded uh, resolutions of the assembly to take action against them, and therefore it must be that they were doing those illegal acts under instructions. Honorable Speaker, we are going to demonstrate through our various pieces of, of evidence that the county assembly has no recourse but to turn to this house for redress and to redeem devolution that has clearly died in Meru. Because for how is a governor that is at war with doctors, that is at war with members of the assembly, that is at war with the church, there is a war with contractors. How is this governor? A governor that has even 
shifted the contracts that are supposed to be done by the people of Meru or even other Kenyans to the national government, while the revolution is about taking resources to the county, how is this governor supposed to deliver for the people of Meru? That is all, Honorable Speaker. Thank you for listening to me. Wait, my line is in Mr. Ndeo can take the remaining minutes. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. In summary, Your Honor, uh, so Mr. Speaker, sir, Honorable Senators, joining issues with the submissions made by my learned friend, and especially on the issue of the attempted arson, it is not a coincidence that attempts to burn down the County Assembly of Meru was done at night of the 8th of August, 2024, when this Senate was seized with, sorry, when the County Assembly was seized with the impeachment motion. It's not a coincidence that individuals have actually been charged before the court of law as a result of that attempt. Honorable Senators, the proposals being made out there, some of which are constitutional, including the dissolution of the county government of Meru, is not a solution to the problem that we have. Why? Because we have identified the problem. The problem is one individual, Governor Kawera. We have identified the problem is a problem of mismanagement. We have identified the problem is a problem of accountability. We have identified the problem. The problem rests with... It rests with Governor Kawera. Service delivery has been compromised. We play to you videos of babies being born outside a health center, being born in a karai. At 11 o'clock in the morning, when you expect the facility to be fully functional, the facility is closed, no services being delivered, Expectant mother delivering inje outside. The people of Meru County expected that with the inception of devolution, and with health sector being apportioned to the county government of Meru, that they will have proper stewardship, that they'll have proper managers, that they'll have people who care about the health status of the people of Meru County. As we speak, there is no explanation that has been ever given by the governor why the expectant mother will have to deliver outside a facility, why a woman has to give birth in a karai, karai amaji. No actions has ever been taken to ensure that such action is not or does not occur. No disciplinary actions taken in respect to that particular facility. So that is the case for the county assembly. We urge you, honorable senators, to listen to us, to give us time to substantiate the simple charges that we shall place before you, honorable senators. It's a case of mismanagement. It's a case of unaccountability. It's a case of bad governance. It's a case of a governor gone rogue. It's a case of victimization of the officers serving under the office of the governor or in, um, uh, serving under the office of the governor. It's, in the, it's in a case of making sure that systems clogs to the benefit of few individuals. That is the simplicity of our case, honorable governors. We'll present you with evidence concrete evidence, honorable senators, to prove that simple case, the case that meets the threshold as enshrined under Article 181 and as read together with Article, uh, with Section 33 of the County Government Act, is a case about the status of the governor uh, of the Meru County government. As I pen off, honorable speakers, some of the proposals being made can be resolved with actions being taken before this Senate. Most obliged. Uh, we now invite the uh
counsel for the governor to proceed to make your opening statement. Your time starts running from now. Not more than 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. I will be doing five minutes. My learned senior, Mr. Ngoya, will do the remaining bit. Before I sit ground to my learned friend, I thought on a process that I... ...23, when we were here for the last impeachment. Council representing the county assembly predicted and or rather prophesied that we will be back here. But council then was very quick to put a disclaimer that though he's not a prophet, neither does he come from a family of prophets, he was sure that we would be here. And for sure, we are here today. So the question is, if council was not a prophet, does not come from a family of prophets, how could he predict with precision that indeed will be here and the prediction comes to pass. Honorable Senators, I came across a quotation by Abraham Lincoln and Peter Drucker who said, the surest way to predict the future is to create it. So they went and created this moment. That's why they were able to predict that we would be here. They created another impeachment while they were still standing prosecuting their previous impeachment motion. Honorable Senators, how did they do this? They went back and we will have evidence to show that one day after the Senate discharged the Senate of all the charges, they were gathered in Nairobi, retreats were held to create a new impeachment motion based on lies. So the people before you today the county assembly of Meru are liars, pathological liars, honorable senators. They went and created lies, not just the ordinary lie, honorable senators, but pathological lies. And the pathological lie, honorable senators, is a lie that is not only untrue, but a lie that is created and believed by the very person who has created that lie. So what they did is to create a lie. Senator Mungatana, you will have an opportunity to uh, make intervention on this opening statement when the time arises. W what is your issue on the use of language? Are you saying there's a language that is un unparliamentary? Yes. Mr. Speaker, basically, I'm not making any intervention except, Mr. Speaker, we're in Senate and we must obey the rules. Lies cannot be a language that is allowed here, Mr. Speaker. Senator Mungatana, if it is their case, if it is their case that the county assembly is lying, then they can say so. If it is their case, they're not, Senator Mungatana, this case is before two parties, the governor and the county assembly. Here, the governor is saying you are being fed to untruths. You may want to romanticize that word, but say as it is, it is what it is. So if in their own case, whatever has been presented to the Senate is not true, then they're really warranted to call it, as they're calling it now, a lie. A proceed, Council. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir, and I hope my time was frozen when uh, the intervention came. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, sir, our case is that simple, that what you're being fed with are lies. Lies that were created while you were still in the floor of this house defending the previous motion. So my choice of the word lie was very deliberate, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir. And the argument, Mr. Speaker, sir, is that the county assembly has created a lie, told the lie, repeated the lie so many times that it started sounding like the truth. They actually went ahead and believed that lie. And they want everyone else in this room and the entire country to believe 
in this lie. And when we look at them in the eye and tell them it's a lie, they get bitter. They get mad. They accuse senators of being bribed. They accuse the governor because they want us to believe a lie because they have themselves created a lie and believed in a lie. Honorable senators, Shakespeare states that a rose by any other name shall still smell as sweet. No matter how much mud they near on the governor, the governor will remain clean. The governor will remain blameless. All they are hoping is that they will bring the governor so many times here that they will keep on repeating one thing and we all believe that indeed there might be some truth in it. It does not make it the truth just because they keep on repeating that same lie. Honorable Senators, you are sitting here as judges, analyze the evidence, scrutinize the, the evidence, ask questions to the uh, witnesses that we produce here, and if it does not add up, send them back, tell them it is a lie, and it is a lie, and the fact that you're repeating that lie will not make it the truth. I yield to my learned friend to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir, and thank you, distinguished senators. For the record, once again, my name is uh, Ongoya. Mr. Speaker, in view of the other interventions, may I know how many minutes I still have for ease of time management? Just proceed. It shall be indicated to you as you proceed. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on November 8, 2023, I had the privilege of appearing before this Senate and addressing this House on a motion for the removal of Governor Kawira Mwangaza from office. That was the third attempt that had been made to remove Her Excellency Honorable Kawira Mwangaza from office by impeachment. It was, however, the second time that attempt was reaching this House. As we stand here today, this is the fifth attempt to remove Governor Honorable Kawira Mwangaza from office. Although it is the third time in total for those attempts to reach this House. It means, Mr. Speaker, distinguished senators, between the, la the time we came here and today, two attempts have been made to remove this governor from office between November 8th and today. That determination on the part of the county assembly either smacks of extreme commitment to salvage Meru County from some funny evil or smacks of extreme malice. I submit very respectfully, I doubt that there can be any middle ground. In my oration before this House on 8th of November last year, I said, and I quote, it matters not whether she shall be brought here 100 times. You cannot victimize her because those who torment her are tireless in their torments against her. I retrieved these words from the hand side of this house. But let me take a step back. Let me take a step back and ask, why did I include these words in my oration, Mr. Speaker, sir? I said those words because while we were before this house, while we were sitting here debating that motion, the mover of the present motion sounded a warning to this house. We didn't have an opportunity then to adduce that evidence because we already finished our filings. We have an opportunity now to adduce this evidence. And she said, and I quote, I want to urge our Senate, if they reinstate Kawira Mwangaza, they should know we have six more times to impeach her. When we are here debating the last motion, they didn't need any new grounds. They were sounding a warning to this house. 
release her and we shall come back six times. If they reinstate her, we will impeach her until the sixth time so that we tell the people of Meru we did our best. We tried to impeach, but the Senate reinstated her. At an appropriate time, not now, we shall play for you clip VKM1, where you'll see those words verbatim. It means we are here today as a matter of statistical count on the part of Honre Pozipora Kenya. She has five more times to go. The question is, Honorable Senators, what can you do as a house tasked to protect devolution to stop this plainly, and we respect Honorable Senators, plainly nefarious use of the impeachment power? Let me pose the critical question on the mind of everybody, including mine. What is ailing Meru County? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, distinguished senators, I make an argument that this question will attract a negative answer and a positive answer. The negative answer is useful for the determination of the matters before you. The positive answer is useful for a long-term engagement with Meru. The negative answer is this. The problem with Meru County is not Her Excellency Honorable Kawira Mwangaza. With humility, Mr. Speaker, let me repeat in clear, unambiguous, and unequivocal terms. Nothing in the acts or omissions on the part of Honorable Kawira Mwangaza warrants her removal from office by way of impeachment, at least as far as that principle is established by law. Let me try to deal with a positive answer. To help us supply a positive answer to this question, we have lined up Honorable Evans Mawira Kaaria, a witness for the governor in these proceedings. Honorable Evans Mawira is significant to these proceedings in four significant ways. Number one, he is a two-time elected MCA in Meru County Assembly, carrying with him a measure of institutional memory. Number two, he is the immediate former leader of majority in the County Assembly of Meru, therefore exposed to the workings of that assembly to a fairly high level. Number three, he was the mover of the impeachment motion against the governor that engaged us here in November 2023, and he is best placed to explain to us what were the undertones and the intricacies in those proceedings. And number four, he will give us a detailed account on how these impeachment motions are conceptualized and what is the thinking behind them. Mr. Speaker, distinguished senators, at this juncture, I can do no better than to take refuge in the voice of one of Africa's perhaps best literary experts, Chinua Achebe, whose voice continues to address us as follows. If the alligator were to come from the water and tell us Mr. Crocodile is sick, who are we to doubt him? Mr. Evans Mawera Kaaria will play that role today. Mr. Speaker, sir, Allow me to derive some lessons from the teachings of an American jurist by the name Robert Jackson. Robert Jackson is a jurist worth listening to or reading from for three reasons. One, he served as the Federal Attorney General of the United States of America. Number two, he served as the prosecutor at Nuremberg. And number three, he served as an associate justice of the Supreme Court of America. No other jurist in America's or world history has met this combination of influential portfolios in his lifetime this far. In 1940, on 1st of April at 10 a.m., Robert Jackson delivered a speech to the second annual conference of the United States attorneys. 
and he was reflecting on the power of prosecutors. I would juxtapose that with the power of impeachers. He observed, and I quote, the prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any other person in America. His discretion is tremendous. While the prosecutor, at his best, is one of the most beneficent forces in our society, when he acts from malice or other base motives, he is one of the worst. He proceeds, if the prosecutor is obliged to choose his cases, it follows that he can choose his defendants. And therein lies the most dangerous power of the prosecutor that he will pick people that he thinks he should rather than cases that need to be prosecuted. In such a case, it is not a question of discovering the commission of a crime and then looking for the man who has committed it. It's a question of picking the man, then searching the law books and putting investigators to work to pin some offense on him. It is in this realm in which the prosecutor picks some person whom he dislikes or desires to embarrass or selects some group of unpopular persons and then looks for an offense that the greatest danger of abuse of prosecuting power lies. It is here that law enforcement becomes personal and the real crime becomes being unpopular with the predominant or governing group. Distinguished senators, I want to make it unequivocal here. The county assembly of Meru has not discovered wrongs against Governor Kawira Mwangaza. It has discovered Honorable Kawira Mwangaza first and has put anything and everything at play to say what allegation can we make against her to possibly embarrass her. Allow me to make some general comments on the impeachment motion before you, conscious of the language of this house, but again mindful to speak the truth in its most manifest form. I repeat, distinguished senators, volume number one of the document in front of you from the county assembly which essentially is the impeachment motion, is simply and squarely a manifesto of lies. This language, Mr. Speaker, sir, is actually strong. And I begin by conceding that, and it requires justification. Let me therefore proceed to justify by making a promissory note. I promise you that at the tail end of this hearing, you will have discovered the following. Number one, when you will retire to consider count number one, paragraph four of the impeachment motion before you, it will read, and I quote, illegally dismissing Dr. Ntoiti, CEO, County Revenue Board, Paul Mwaki, CEO of Lika Board, Kenneth Kimathi Mbae, Managing Director of Meru Finance Corporation, and Joseph Kiture Mberia, CEO MWAS, in the usurpation of the powers of the appointing authorities. When you look at the motion you dispensed with last November, count number four, you will see paragraph 16b, sending Dr. Ntoiti, that same Ntoiti, Paul Mwaki, that same Paul Mwaki. Kenneth Kimathi Mbae, that same Kenneth Kimathi Mbae. Joseph Kiture Mberia, that same Joseph Kiture Mberia on indefinite compulsory leave. You are redebating the same matter you debated and voted on here in all its substantive content. Number two. When you look at count number three, paragraph three of the motion before you, you will find a charge of allegation of employing a bloated workforce of at least 111 personal staff in the governor's office. Good people. 
count four, paragraph G of the last impeachment motion read, employing a bloated workforce, more than 100 personal staff in the office of governor. The Swahili say, Ukistajabu ya Musa, utaone ya Firauni. You will be surprised that the documentary evidence, the piece of paper that was used to support count four, paragraph G of the last impeachment motion, is the same piece of paper with the same names in the same order that has been attached to the motion before you. That thing that you voted and said has not been proved. I think the county assembly is trying to try this and embarrass this Senate so that if you vote to the contrary, they will now be in the blogosphere saying how inconsistent you are in your decision making. Evidence will show that any attempt by the County Public Service Board of Meru to add any staff in the governor's office since November, the governor has responded by declining those staff and saying you employ staff and send them here, then you take me to Senate. You'll see those letters of the governor rejecting any staff. There's no additional staff with the governor's approval in her office since we left here. And the words used by the governor in her rejection letter is that you are sending here this staff to create grounds for my impeachment. Allow me to then give you a promissory note on what my learned colleague, Mr. Mutuma, addressed here. You will find across, you'll come across the following claims at the end of this impeachment exercise that are false. These claims are factually false. Ground one, paragraph three A. You'll be told the governor failed to implement the recommendations of the county assembly requiring the governor to dismiss the county secretary, Dr. Kiambi Aderu, and chief of staff, Harzon Gitobu Njambi. Then two, that the governor ignored or failed to submit a report to the county assembly on the implementation of the recommendations within 60 days. Distinguished senators, you will go through all the six volumes that the county assembly has presented before you, you will not see any Hansard or any resolution of the county assembly to any of these two facts. Number two, you will not see any letter by the clerk or other official of Meru County Assembly transmitting a resolution of this nature from the Meru County Assembly. Distinguished senators, how else can you describe this than a lie? Can there be another word in the dictionary of Englishmen and women that can describe this, if not a lie? Number two, ground number one, paragraph four, illegally dismissing Dr. Antoiti. And by the way, senators, if I forget, Dr. Antoiti is an employee of the county government of Nairobi, as we speak today, not Meru. Dr. Antoiti, and he has been so since 2007. This is something that's going to emerge from these proceedings. Dr. Antoiti, Paul Mwaki, Kenneth Kimathi, and Joseph Kature Mberia. One, none of these people have ever been dismissed from service, none. Two, you will see by evidence, these were people on fixed term contracts, some of whom their contracts came to an end. Others among them, they discovered they had maneuvered their ways and gotten their way to two governments and they ran away by themselves. One of them is Dr. Antoiti, the county government of Nairobi. We will show you correspondence from Nairobi County government revealing this fact. Therefore, how else can you describe this? You will see this governor has not dismissed any of them as a matter of fact. Ground two, paragraph six. You will be told, or you are told, that the governor deliberately and knowingly misled the public that 86,000 shillings, quote unquote, 86 million shillings, my apologies for that, 86 million shillings, quote unquote, had been raised through pay bill number 247, 247, account number 0400163917899. There'll be no evidence by documentary or video or even witness evidence showing the governor has ever mentioned this pay bill number 
or mentioned this account number anywhere. It is a fact we will prove by evidence. The leaders who have waged war against the governor have collected money across multiple pay bill numbers, m -Pesa platforms, and cash accounts that have not been presented to this Senate. It is a submission. If the county assembly has decided to make the issue of the money collected in relation to the unfortunate death of Sniper an issue in this Senate, they must make a full and candid disclosure of how much money was collected across all these platforms. Ground three, paragraph eight, irregular payment of emergency call allowances to 161 doctors and medical doctors using the wrong rates. One, as a matter of fact, the governor is neither a salary processing or a salary paying officer in the county government of Meru. But two and more importantly, substantively, the emergency call allowance complaint of here is expressly contained in the collective bargaining agreement negotiated between the national government, the Ministry of Health, and KMPDU. The instructions were cascaded down from the principal secretary to the council of governors and to all counties. No cent has been paid outside the figures set out in that collective bargaining agreement. I think, let me use the brief time I have here, because we are also the public listening to us, to make it clear to the doctors in Meru that the compliance by the county government of Meru with their hard fought and negotiated CBA, and we, we all know it's the public domain, some officials of KMPDU actually went in jail for some days in the course of these 2017 negotiations. Implementation is actually landing a governor in problems. Ground three, paragraph nine, use of a manual payroll to pay personnel emoluments. One, this is the, something you'll find very uh, paradoxical. As at 25th June, 2024, the County Assembly of Meru had raised this question with the County Executive on whether there is a manual payroll. And the County Executive had answered satisfactorily that there was no longer use of a manual payroll in the County Government of Meru. That's number one. But number two, the same audit report that the county assembly will give you showing that there may have been use of manual payroll previously will show use of manual payroll in the county itself as well in the same financial year and we're not here to equal terms we're making a simple case that the procedure of processing the integrated payroll personnel database numbers ippd numbers takes time and therefore, the employees who are in the meantime accommodated on the manual payrolls are there for the limited purpose when we are waiting for the Directorate of Personnel Management in the Ministry of Public Service to generate IPPD numbers. These are nursery school teachers whom we cannot keep for eight months as they wait for their IPPD numbers before they begin earning. There is no allegation of loss of any coin in these circumstances. I have addressed the issue of the blood, alleged bloated workforce in the governor's office, but you see they say there are 111 personal staff in the governor's office. As a matter of fact, we do not have 111 personal staff in the governor's office. It is simply not true. On the allegation that uh, one Kiambi Crispus Manyara was paid, one, the governor is not the head of pub public county service involved in interdiction or suspension of staff. Number two, the governor does not process or pay any staff of the county government. The allegation, therefore, that this governor has paid Kiambi Crispus Manyara is actually factually false. Mr. Speaker, sir, distinguished senators, I, I spent my two minutes to address certain overall 
sorry may, may i just have one minute to summarize up something just one minute i i didn't know my time was up i thought it's two minutes we have said before mr speaker and we reiterate that the county assembly of Meru brings here the governor because it lacks respect for this oversight institution if the team upstairs has uh, access to video number vkm18 counsel for the governor your your time is up my apologies i'll give you one more minute thank mind. you so much thank you so much so may i just ask uh, the team upstairs to run for me video vkm18 at minute 1.18 to 1.17 strictly has in the interest of time uh, access to video number vkm18 Counsel for the... The house of shame. Your time is up. That house of greed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Called the, the Senate. The team upstairs to run for me video VKM18 at minute 1.18 to 1.17 strictly in the end of time. Uh, access to video number VKM18. Counsel for the... Of shame. Of shame. That house of greed. Of greed. Thank you so much. Called the Senate, the Senate, a house of shame, a house of greed. Ainda trundishia ugonjwa huu meru, atunga kuwa hapa. Thank you so much. That is the General Secretary of DEB Party, a party with 20 members in the Meru County Assembly that has partly sponsored the motion before you. I rest the Governor's opening arguments. Now, honorable senators, kindly be upstanding. Honorable senators, it is now 12.49. It is time to adjourn the Senate. The Senate, therefore, stands adjourned until today, Monday, the 19th of August, 2024, at 2.30 p.m. Thank you.